The healthcare industry is an aggregation and integration of sectors within the, social, um, the economic system that provides good services to treat patients with curative, preventive, rehabilitative, and palliative care. The modern healthcare industry includes three essential branches, which are services, products, and finance. Dr. Emeka Onyewu is a certified plastics and rec reconstructive surgeon by the American Board of Surgery. He is currently working on children on a children's initiative where all children 12 years old and younger who require surgery can access free specialized surgery in Nigeria. Remember, you can join the conversation. Tweet us at Plus TV Africa or at Waste Your Africa One with the hashtag Waste or send an SMS to 081 Thanks for joining us, Dr. Emeka. It's my pleasure. Ah. <laughs> now, when I saw that part of, you know, doing free surgeries for children 12 years old and younger, I said, okay, now we finally have a doctor that has a hat. <laughs> you know, because um, this is something that is, is close to my heart because I know that not many people, the kinds of um, cases you see, especially on the street, when they take them, go begging, not many of them can actually afford the kind of surgery or the kind of medical care that can solve that problem. What led you, you know, to, to start that um, initiative for children? Um, it's an interesting uh, story, and I'll try to be brief, but in 2003, I was working at Howard University Hospital, and the, the head of the International Medicine Division there happened to be a Nigerian woman. And she said, hey guys, get me a team, I want to do a medical mission to Nigeria. So, and she said, oh, my parents lived in Oweri at the time. So I said, well, wow, free trip home. You know, I'll, you know, I'll go do a couple of operations and go see my people. Uh, and, and I tell people this, if you've ever done a medical mission once, you'll never be the same. Wow. You'll just never be the same. And it got to the point where I, I did medical missions for the joy of medicine and I just worked, you know, in America for the money. And we did 19 medical missions after that time, two a year for seven years, right? Wow. Uh, and and I have, I've never had trouble getting doctors to volunteer to come to do the work. It's tough, though. You do the work, you're happy, you go, and everything goes back the way it was. It's not sustainable. You can't... Thank you, can't, you so much. Yeah, you, know, you can't treat people. I like that, not so, um, sustainable, because no. now we hear that... Sometimes the government say that they donate certain things like free medical days, oxygen, you know, to hospitals and all of that. Then you go to the hospitals for the people that need this, um, this um, services. services or the health um, equipment or whatever. And they ask you as the, what's it called, the patient to, to pay. pay. Mm. After the, the government has said this is free or even international donors. Because you work a lot with um, the international space where you bring in things to hospitals here to support them to Absolutely. do, yeah. So how do you even monitor to ensure that these things that you're doing is actually getting to the people that need it the most? You know, that's, that's a million dollar question uh, and we can just keep trying. So there are organizations all around the world, all they do is donate free equipment. I mean, there are lists of them. We had four containers of, of equipment shipped to Imo State University when they first opened their medical school mm -hmm. in 2007, free. They pay for, you pay for the shipping and everything was a CT scan, there was an MRI, there was all kinds of stuff in there. So they're, they're, it's there. Now once it gets here, you know, uh, some of the organizations that donate will send a scout to look through to make sure that you're not just selling the equipment when it gets here, but I think the reason for this children's initiative was we need something that's sustainable. Sometimes you just have to do it yourself because you can't rely on somebody else who's coming from a different perspective. Uh, and so coming from my angle, I feel that I, we need to give back. I mean, we are so blessed. You know, we, giving back is the least that we can do. And children are usually the most affected. I, I saw adults with cleft lip who are 30 years old married with children. You would never see a child in America over two with a cleft lip. It just it would just get fixed. It's so basic, you know. So uh, our children are really, I felt, um, is a great place to start. It, it would really not be that hard to get surgeons to come in twice a year and do operations for free. So once we set so up the based on the medical uh, missions you've had in Nigeria, what are the challenges you faced having it done in Nigeria, in the health sector in Nigeria? Um, a lot of the places we went to were just not equipped 
for the kind of work that we do. And I think the uh, the, the doctor was on, on, who was on here earlier, Dr. Remy, yes. yeah, was very, very clear about that. And so we, we really have to do a lot of work, and sometimes we have to improvise. Um, we could not have surgical missions in in extremely remote areas because they just couldn't you know, put an OR together and things like that. You know, we've been to places, the first time I went to a warrior, the OR was four walls, that's it. There was nothing, not even a table. Wow. There's no air wow. conditioning, you know, so we had to hustle up. Some government officials helped us get it, you know. So the biggest challenge is just, is just having it, the infrastructure, like you said earlier, that can, that can allow us to do the work that we can do. Um, and after that, I think it's, it's, transfer of knowledge is, is bringing local people in mm -hmm. who don't look at us as a threat or trying to take their space. Sort of, um, governmental, sorry. Mm -hmm. Do you have any fo form of governmental bureaucracy while you're trying to? Of course. Challenges while Everywhere. you're trying to have it done? <laughs> of course. I brought a team once. I think we were going to, I don't even say a state <laughs> to embarrass them. <laughs> we got all the way to Lagos, 21 people. And we got to Lagos and I, I called the contact and I said, well, you know, okay, we need a flight to come to Kaduna to work. We're here equipment. And he's like, oh, uh, can you can you do it next week? I'm like, next week? We're in Lagos. We're here. We have our equipment. We have so we spent three days in Lagos just fooling around until, you know, we we're able to get everything set up to go. So sometimes you run into bureaucracy. You really need somebody on ground who's just as committed and then usually you don't run into problems. And after you've done a few, you, you kind of get used to it. Okay, so my question would be the collaboration. So when you come in, what effort do you make to collaborate with Nigerians that are on ground? And also, I'm asking this because of the sustainability, because you do that, as you said, you do, you go, you come back, and then it's all worse. So what, what are you doing? What's the collaborative effort you're having with doctors here to ensure that the work that you're doing is not in vain or can continue. Right, so the first two or three missions we did, we just came in like gangbusters, did the surgery, rolled <laughs> out, celebrities. And, and then even for us, it wasn't satisfying. You'd come back to the same place and start from zero. I think by, probably like the fourth mission, we made it a requirement for us to come to have a team of physicians that would work with us. Okay. We tried to eliminate that us versus them sort of mentality. And we would make sure, and all the equipment we'd bring, we'd leave with them when we left. And now they're used, to, they're trained on how to use it. Um, and, and sometimes it takes two or three missions coming back over and over again. One time we came back, and said, oh, the, the machine's not working. And they just hadn't turned the, 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 the knob. knob. Yeah, that's it, plugged it in, you know. So um, I think, yeah, definitely now we, we insist on having a local team. And we work together, we screen the patients together. We involve them and, and we, we, we learn from them and they learn from us. So what, what, let me try to take us to medical tourism because um, I visited your hospital I think last week or so um, or this week, earlier this week and I saw a lot of, you know, it's looking like <laughs> something very, very decent that you can, you know, um, what's it called? Anybody can get treated if you have a surgery that you want to do and all of that. But there's still this lack of confidence in anything that is based here in Nigeria. Everybody feels that they need to gather money, go to India, or go to where else again are they going to? US for babies. You know, for, for <laughs> no, babies is, is not surgery. Yeah. You, know, know. <clears throat> you know, yeah. Egypt, would, yeah, UK. Yeah, they just still feel the need. You know, why do you think, first of all, that is, despite the fact that a lot of people are now coming back home, people like you are coming back home to say, okay, you know what, this is, what we're offering here in Nigeria, you don't have to go. But why do you think people still do that? I mean, my theory is that culturally, at least from where I come, people went to hospitals to die. Right? When you were sick, you went to your chemist, you went, did everything else, you bought the drugs off the street, whatever you needed to do, and when everything failed, you go to the hospital. Of course, people died. I think hospitals had this reputation of not really curing people. Uh, and that's, that's a, I mean, that thing's been ingrained in the culture for so long. It's very difficult to change that overnight. I think those of us in the private sector that are coming home and setting up things, we're, we are really trying to prove that we can take care of our people. And we can take care of them to the same level anywhere in the world. You know, we're Nigerians, you know, we can't, not to sound arrogant, but Nigerians are everywhere. You know, yeah, in Washington, D.C., I can everywhere. get a Nigerian in every subspecialty of medicine. So I think it's going to take some time for us to prove to the people that we can do this. And the word's getting out, I think, that 
there are facilities, you know, there's Redditing and Echo. There are a lot of places out there that are doing great work. And eventually, when we can start getting other countries to come here, I think then the job will be done and, and our Nigerians will start staying. So are you willing to come back and stay permanently? <laughs> I'm back. I'm here. <laughs> Answer the question. <laughs> Dr. Naka cannot escape this question. You know what I'm asking? No, he can't escape the question. You won't do what Dr. Remy did to me. <laughs> so why would you not, you know, probably come here and stay permanent? Because that is part of the reasons a lot of people, because of, you know, of course, the difference is really clear. Most of us don't come back because it's very difficult to leave a decent paying job um, career and just start from zero, set up shop. You know, but you know, medicine's a long training, you know. So by the time you're you start to roll, you're you know, you've been doing this thing for schooling and twenty years, all this stuff. So I, one of the reasons why we set up here is we figured that if we could create a, a soft landing ground for physicians to come test the waters, spend a few months, a few weeks, what you can learn the system without having to invest um, that huge capital, that we can encourage more people to come home. And that's, that's really the, that's the core of why we set it up. And then, so that's, that's really the reason. It's very, it's very difficult. Obviously, the, the longer you've been in your career in America, for instance, the more you make. I mean, you've been, you've become a seasoned veteran, and you, know, you move up, you move up. And then you want somebody 20 years later to just drop that and start from zero. It's very difficult. It's very it's difficult. It's very difficult. And I think that's why. I, don't think, I think most people want to help. That's why they come on the missions. Yes. And they'll come for a week. But it's just it's, it's a big ask. So why do you make so much abroad? Is it because the government has made you priority? And how do you think we can begin to change that here in Nigeria? I think, I really think that um, health and education in most uh, first world countries are huge priorities because hunger isn't. You know, let's let's be fair, yeah. we're not really on the same level yet. And the budget they have, and to be honest with you, the physician salaries I think make up about 7% of the healthcare budget. There's this, it's a drop of the budget, but they put a lot of money into growth as we talked about earlier about new technology and you know so there's a lot of money in the healthcare sector and that's probably why and if you don't pay them people will not go into medicine they'll go into something else yeah, so what's said, the role of leadership in the health sector what's the role of leadership how essential is it for um, um what was it called um the medical um sector to be how do you, what's the word now? Library, to grow. Successful, to grow. To grow. Yes. I mean, you hit the nail on the head. It's, it's very key. It's very key. And, and that leadership doesn't have to be from a medical person. It could be from anywhere. But you have to believe that this is important for your people. And you have to understand it's a, it's a marathon, not a sprint. You have to start little and, and put the steps in place. Um, she mentioned two things, accessibility and affordability. But I think accountability is probably the third one that nobody talks about. The reason, you talked about you can't sue or you're mourning. Yeah. It's not even a sue issue. I think the, it, you have to have some kind of accountability from your peers, from the MDC, and you know, from the government, somebody. Because people have to, when they know they have to be accountable, they're, they're really going to pay more attention to, to mistakes and to keeping up with current teachings and you know they just and will trends. right and trends and I think you have a better overall health system if people take it seriously yeah. okay so my question would be <clears throat> will we say that it works so well outside because it just just don't depend on the government like a huge population don't depend on the government to provide the best and I would say this because I know that health in America is not cheap it's not cheap at all and then also the insurance works. But then again, I go back to it's not cheap. So how, what, what advice do you have for a government? Is there a, a formula, is there a mixture? Do we have to partner with the private sector? What is, what is it that you can take from your learnings and then give us an advice to, to the Nigerian government? I, I kind of think outside the box. I think we rely too much on government. Oh, we bless you. <laughs> yeah, I, I really do. I think we look for the government to just drop manna from heaven. I mean, the government has its place, but you know, I tell people, even when you're mentoring kids, you have to you take some responsibility. You know, and the private sector. I mean, it, we're all people, part of the people. Yeah, the government should make sure that the least among us is taken care of. Yeah. But the government's not responsible for setting up the whole system, 
You know, they should set the policies in place that allow growth. They should set the, you know, make it easy for entrepreneurs to come in into the market and make things. That's the role of the government, not to provide it, you know, because governments are terrible at monitoring things. And Okay, so now <laughs> I want to ask a very light question. Okay. <clears throat> in Lekki, I don't know about any other place in Lekki, <laughs> everybody that you see, if you go out in the night, has an hourglass shape. <laughs> <laughs> The one that has five children has an hourglass shape. We that have two that we're struggling to take out the tummy, <laughs> we can't say it. But uh, when I read your profile and I saw that, okay, you are a plastic surgeon. I said, okay, a reconstructive <laughs> surgeon. I said, I must ask this question. Because we see a lot of young people submitting themselves to all sorts of um, doctors in the name of trying to get a flat tummy, I hear they remove a rib, they do this, they do that. Please, what are the health hazards for all of these things? All right, so. And is it everybody that, that needs that to needs do this? Thing. Well, most of the people that are doing it don't need it. They want it, obviously. Okay. And things... I want it. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the yeah. more people that have it, the more pressure there is on everybody else to have it, too. I, I, and this comes back to the accountability thing. I think that. The problem is not that the procedure, pre procedures are re is a relatively safe procedure. Really? Absolutely. Um, the problem is that um, the pe people, some people are doing it who are not adequately trained to do it. I mean, just we'll call a spade a spade. And so, you know, I always tell people, if you do something dangerously in medicine, you may get away with it 90% of the time, but 10% of the time somebody's going to die. Um, you want to be, you don't want to be, and you, don't, you can't tell who's, who's going to be in the 10%, right? So a lot of the physicians that are doing this are very aggressive. They're doing things that would never be allowed to be done in the yeah. U.S. or the U.K. In fact, in the U.S., when people want to get that extreme, they go to Dominican Republic or some island and get it done. They can't get it done in America okay. because because one complication is huge. And the doctor will lose his license for life. Well, and, I and you won't be able to sleep. It's not even just your license. I mean, how do you sleep at night mm -hmm. knowing that somebody died uh, in Our head? doctors are sleeping. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I want to lean on Uwa's question and say, what is the mental and psychological effect? So if I come to you and I say, oh, I want my boobs to be bigger, do, do you talk to me? What do I need, you know, some psychological talk, address? What is it that you tell me, or you just go ahead and say, okay, what's okay, cup size? You. What's the cup size? You want a double, double D? D. <laughs> yeah. No, and that's why a consultation, average consultation, takes almost an hour, 45 minutes an hour. You have to you talk. You're kidding me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I, and, you know, you come in, I don't have you change. We sit down and have a conversation first. You know, listen to what, what are you trying to accomplish. Don't tell me what you want. Tell me, don't say, oh, I want, you know, boobs, I, just tell me what, you, what I don't like this or I like this, this is what I want to change. And then we can look at the options, what's safe for you, are you having more children later, you know, should you postpone this, do it later? you have to have a conversation and get it. Now if you say, oh, you know, I think, you know, my husband's going to leave me so I want to get my boobs done, that's not a valid reason, no, really, I mean, people do, that's not a valid reason, I take a step back, like, okay, let's, let's talk about this some more, you know. As opposed to somebody that says, I've, this has really bothered me all my but life. People have a lot of insecurities, so low self-esteem, and they just want to look good to, you know. But the thing is, after doing that, would, would you actually well, be satisfied? Well, that's what I'm saying. It depends on your reason. So if you're in a bad relationship and you have bigger breasts, you'll still be in a bad relationship. Mm -hmm. And then you're coming to me ups, unhappy after I did my work. You know, that's not, I mean, you know I mean? That's, that's not why I'm here. So... So if, is fat transfer safe? Because we're running a bit out of time. Very fat safe. Fat transfer is safe. Very safe. But it depends on how it's done. Done properly. Pro 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 professionally. Yeah. Then we have a lot of people doing implants and all of that. Are those safe as well? All right. So breast implants are safe. They've been around for 30, 40 years. The new ones are do not cause cancer. They don't cause any problems. Saline mm. or silicone, 100% mm. safe. Mr. Mm. Saline. <laughs> <laughs> fat tra yeah, fat transfers. <laughs> can kill you if it's if you get fat into a blood vessel. Yeah. That's why I said oh. you have to know the layers of where you can put it safely and you have to not be aggressive. I think that's where you have the problems when you're Probably, too aggressive. Yeah. Most of these things are safe. They really are safe. Oh, thank right you hands. so much, doctor. I hope... Uh, oh, by the way, you're saying it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> no, we're going to call. So. <laughs> ah, for the life of anybody that has lived that matter. <laughs> All right, so in case you missed um, today's quote, here it is. Um, in my opinion, our healthcare system has failed when a doctor fails to treat an illness that is treatable. That's from Kevin Allen Lee. Do you agree with that, Dr. Emeka? Um, yes, I, I really have to agree. Um, 
and, and like, you know, it's a multifactorial thing. Sometimes it's not just that, oh, the doctor missed it. Sometimes it's, you're right, he doesn't have the right tools, tools, equipment. Sometimes he's overworked and misses things. You know, you don't work as well without sleep. So there are a lot of reasons. But if there's a disease, there are enough diseases we can't treat. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of them. The ones we can, let's, try. Let's, let's, try, and let's try and treat. The ones that we know how to treat, like, we need yeah. to treat them. We really do. We'd love to bring you back. I hope you come back. Uh, anytime. <laughs> yeah. All right, so catch... Um, Live episodes every weekend from Fridays to Sundays at 8 p.m. as we bring thought-provoking and engaging informative conversations to your screen. Ladies, have you had a good time today? Well, I've been informed <laughs> that some things are safe. That some things can still happen. <laughs> <laughs> but I've had, I've had a good time. How about you, Isi? You've had a good time? Insightful. All right. Doctor, Absolutely. you've had a good time. Excellent. All Excellent. right. Thank so you. you can watch a repeat broadcast at um, 3 p.m. tomorrow for this episode. And um, catch all our previous episodes on YouTube. Just go to Plus TV Africa flow, um, slash YouTube. Ah, tomorrow is going to be a beautiful day. So we'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a lovely evening.